Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode three of the Long Range Noob Podcast, the podcast for people new to long range shooting, brought to you by people new to long range shooting. I am your co host, Jace Leroy. With me, as always, we have Ryan Bob Rostanowski with us today. Bob Rostanowski. <laughs> do, do I paint the scene or something? Or uh... Ryan's been doing a little painting lately. Oh, that is true. Yeah. On his rifles. So he's been, uh, he's, he's been hard at work in the studio <laughs> painting those, painting, painting those rifles away. up. That's right. <laughs> Got two of them this week. We've somehow made it to episode three. Somehow. Yeah. I don't know how. It's been a journey. But we're here. And Ryan and I have been talking a little bit about moving into a, uh, one episode a week. So weekly podcast if we can swing it what do you think about that right anything we can do it i i think we're gonna we're gonna give it a shot you know um, and it's it's not for the lack of content it's no. a lack of time right it's uh you know we both work uh regular jobs um well, at least i do i don't know what jace does but uh <laughs> so, <laughs> this so, is all i do yeah <laughs> but um yeah we, so we uh we both work a lot but um it'd be fun to get this in uh you know, definitely once a week. That'd be awesome. So we're going to shoot for it. Yeah. Hopefully Ryan's wife and three kids will allow it. Right. <laughs> Just kidding, ladies. He's single. So hit him up. Oh. You know what I mean? Thanks, Jace. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. What do we got going on today? Uh, today's episode, um, I'm not quite sure what the title is yet, but it'll be something along the lines of um, how to go about purchasing a rifle for long range application. We've had a, a couple of requests for, for something along those lines, and that only makes sense for somebody who's new, because there's a lot of people out there, like Ryan and, and myself, who grew up around guns, shot a lot of guns growing up, uh, but never really shot it for long-range purposes. I think that's kind of a... Um, I mean, a bit... that's where we were at, you know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, were at, we were there a year ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had done some hunting. Um I not so much. I don't think I had really ever shot past uh, maybe 150 yards till till we you know got into it just recently. And till so, we realized guns are capable of shooting past 100 right? yards. Right. <laughs> Doesn't just magically stop there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I've been hunting since I was 12. Uh, not I'm not. I wouldn't consider myself an avid hunter. I really enjoy it, and I actually enjoy the aspect of of spending time with like my brother and my dad, cousins and friends. Um, I, I enjoy that the most, I, but, uh, I've done some hunting over the years and most of my, my kills have been anywhere between 150 and 250 yards, uh, with the exception of, of one bighorn sheep hunt that I did. Uh, let's see, that's about a year and a half ago. And I, yeah, and you actually did pretty well on that one, didn't you? Well, well, I well, I feel well, 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 well a relative term. <laughs> I shot, I shot a very nice animal, and it's hanging on the wall at my parents' house because I don't have room for it where I'm at now. But uh, in order to bag this animal, I had to take uh, <laughs> my fair share of of uh, shots at it. So <laughs> yeah, so um, it, that actually kind of sparked my interest in long range shooting because I drew out on this hunt and it was kind of astronomical in terms of the odds. They, I think they only give four or five tags in the state of Utah in the Southern area down there in the Zion area is where I drew out. And usually it takes a long, long time to draw out. And, and luckily my dad has been on top of it since I was old enough to put in for hunts. And so I had points accumulating for anyone not familiar with how hunting works. Um, a lot of hunts you, you put in for the tag and it's kind of like a lottery. And so when you first start putting in for it, you're, you're most likely not going to draw out for it, especially a special hunt like this, which is called a once in a lifetime hunt, because once you do it, you can't do it anymore. You're done. So anyway, after the years go by, you start to accumulate, uh, points. And so the more points you have in the hunt, the better odds you have of drawing out on it. Anyway, I was really lucky to draw out on it, and I was also lucky enough to get my hands on a rifle from a company called Gunworks out of uh, Wyoming, mm. and they they specifically they build rifles for the, the specific purpose of long-range hunting. And so anyway, I shot my sheep at about 450 yards, and 
I think that's kind of what got the fire started. So, yeah, I mean, me, um, it was just, uh, you know, I'd done pretty much everything else as far as shooting goes, and and it was just something new and different, and uh, hadn't done it before, so dived in face first, basically. <laughs> he did. So... <laughs> he did. Dove in face first. It was yeah. It was quite the sight to to behold. <laughs> <laughs> Literally face first, right on and into the gun and shooting. So, yep. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about getting our first uh, long range weapons and kind of the process that we went went through in doing so. So, uh, Ryan, I'm gonna let you start on kind of your journey of s- selecting the rifle oh. that you wanted. Um, maybe kind of the growing pains you went through and what you've learned from that and Mm -hmm. uh, what you find to be now that you've kind of gone through that process, what you find to be more important and let, and other things less important. Um, basically I knew that I wanted to get, you know, like a bolt action rifle. Um, I really wasn't, uh, I guess too aware, I guess of different calibers at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I kind of knew of the 260 and, uh, some of the other kind of, more specialty calibers calibers i guess i would say um really not nato i guess Uh um but i've i've always kind of you know been of the opinion of of you know i'd i'd like something that i can get readily available i can get my hands on it you know i can uh, go to walmart and pick yeah pick up yeah exactly ammo wise uh caliber wise to go uh go to walmart be able to pick up a box of it if I needed to. Um, I've been, you know, I've, as I've said before, I've been reloading forever, um, but I uh, still kind of wanted to stick kind of w- with what was familiar to me and what mm-hmm. I knew. Um, and so, you know, was that a good choice? Um, maybe, you know. Um, are there better choices? Again, maybe, you know. Yeah. But uh, but it's what I chose, and... Uh, uh, yeah, so that's what I'm what I'm kind of uh, currently doing now. Uh, so I've I did pick up a Tika, as I've said before, in the 308 caliber. Um, I chose that one because uh, I shoot a lot of 300 blackout uh, with my uh, uh, little 300 blackout pistol. And uh, before this last week, I did also have a 16 inch uh, AR-15 chambered in 300 blackout. That did change though just recently <laughs> um so we'll talk about that a little later but yeah so i i was already very familiar with that 300 caliber round and and kind of wanted to stick with that um so really the options were 300 win mag or uh 308 and um you know i'm not really sure why i didn't uh go with a 300 win mag probably the the rifle that i ended up wanting uh, wasn't chambered in 300 Win Mag mm-hmm. uh, that I saw, uh, so it was that Tika CTR, um, and they only had them in in 308 and 260, and so that, those were kind of our choices at the time if mm-hmm. if we wanted to stick with that rifle. Yeah, um, and Tika yeah. makes a lot like basically every caliber under the sun if you want. Yeah, one of their mm-hmm. other models, but we really we liked the the CTR model because it came with threaded a threaded barrel, mm-hmm. and. Um, and it, it did top have rail. the, uh, yeah, the top rail. Uh huh. So um, had those things kind of stock and built in. Uh, had an elevated cheek riser kind of built in as well. Um, so I mean, my gun is is pretty stock as far as you know what I've done to it. Um, you know, I've I've given it a paint job, which uh, if you guys <laughs> haven't seen it yet, uh, check out our Facebook page. Uh, it's it looks pretty sweet. Uh, Jace has seen it in real life, and so I don't know. Can you attest to the? Yes, the... I and I mean I don't, I don't use the nickname Bob Ross loosely, um, <laughs> so that's definitely a compliment. Uh, Ryan basically just took some cans of what did you use on it? Krylon? Uh, it's Rustoleum. Rustoleum. Their camouflage right. uh, product line. So. so, so he got some camouflage Rustoleum, and he went to town on that thing, and. You can you can see the step by step process that he went through. In yeah, some took photos some, took some on photos. Facebook mm-hmm. on our uh, long range noob page. So if you want to check those out, feel free to jump in and and uh, see what he's done. But but yeah, I was I was really impressed. It looked just as good as anything I've seen that comes from a factory. And the great thing is is he 
kind of customize it the way he wanted in terms of mm-hmm. the pattern he wanted on there. And he used just some some grass that he <laughs> stole from Mother Earth. <laughs> right. And, uh, right used, out of the ground. <laughs> right out of the ground. <laughs> and he used that to give give himself some pattern and texture, and it turned out really nice. So. Yeah, yeah and then a awesome. nice a nice uh, polyurethane finish over the top. Ryan's so. not afraid to. No, so he, not afraid. He, he also got, uh, and he'll probably talk about this. Uh, he also got a new optic and fresh out of the box, the first thing he did to a spray paint it. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> this uh, <laughs> this needs to look a little different. This needs a new color to it. Yeah, this so. uh, fifteen. How much did it cost? Sixteen hundred dollars. No, no, I got. Did I you get it for got a good the. Deal? Uh, I got it for twelve nineteen. Oh, that's right. So yeah, over a thousand dollars is the first thing he does spray paint it. But it turned out yeah. really nice, and uh, now yeah. he just runs the risk of losing his rifle because it is so it's, well camouflaged. Yes. Lose it in the grass or something. So. <laughs> so, but you never drop your rifle in the grass. So <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna set it down. You're gonna turn around to pee, and then you're gonna come back. And you're <laughs> it's not, you're gone. Like, I don't know where I put it. My rifle yeah. is gone, and then you're gonna trip on it. Right. <laughs> Um, and Ryan mentioned NATO rounds earlier and yes, that's, yeah. that stands for, I believe, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Sure. I don't know. <laughs> Wikipedia would tell us. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, I may have to correct myself or someone's going to have to correct us. I think that's what it stands for. And, yeah. oh um, yeah. North Atlantic Treaty Organization. There it is. Confirmed. Everything yes. on Wikipedia is true. So it, yep. Everything. We got a con- confirmation there. And basically... I guess a way to think of NATO rounds, anything that's chambered and is considered a NATO round, it's just used all over the world. Would you say mm-hmm. that's pretty accurate? Yeah, yeah, and that's really the the benefit to it. You so know, it's you just can super, find them. yeah, it's super plentiful, and that mm-hmm. like uh, five five six, um, mm-hmm. three oh eight, yeah, um, nine mil, I nine believe. mil, I think, yeah. Uh, I mean, do they consider AK like the seven six two by thirty nine? Um, that might be a NATO round. Um, I mean, there might be a ton. I don't know. I I'm, mean, it's it's super popular if if it's not. So yeah. I mean, yeah. So that's I mean, a, that's a the fifty four R. You know, they've they've got all sorts, but mm-hmm. um, I don't know if that's NATO either. But or most people use two two three and three oh eight. Yeah. And so three oh eight's wildly popular and has been used for a long, long time, and mm-hmm. I I think it's a great. Uh, I feel like there's a there's positive and negatives to any, to any round. I feel like 308 falls right in right kind in of the middle. middle. Yeah. <laughs> so, yep. I think it's a great round for that reason because people hunt with it. Uh, is it the best round to go hunting with? No. Um, people shoot long range with it. Is it the best round to shoot long range? No. But no. there's, I mean, some people would say you know get a 338 Lapua and it's gonna you're gonna be able to shoot out there way further, right. but Elephant it's, gun, it's $5 you know? a bullet. And, yeah. you know, yeah, I mean, it's going to wreck your body shooting it. And so those are the things you kind of got away. And and I, that's the thing I do like about a three oh eight is that it's comfortable to shoot. It's not mm-hmm. too ex- it's not too expensive to reload no, for at all. all. Brass is plentiful. You can buy oh, yeah. you can buy brass on Amazon in, you know, by the bagfuls kind of the point i'm making on that is that 308 is very easy to come by it's easy to shoot and it's affordable and it's really easy i i feel to get caught up in well i've got to have this you know yeah yeah and and, mm-hmm. and i think you gotta you gotta kind of watch watch yourself on that because like i said there's there's positives and negatives to everything when it comes to this sport and you mm-hmm. just gotta find what fits best for you which which kind of brings us to the to our topic which right is you know what what rifle's best for you and it's there, there's not there's not a single answer for that that fits everyone there's not a one if there was one rifle out there that's the best rifle and the best caliber everybody would be shooting it mm-hmm. right so um, that just goes to show you there's so many calibers and rifles and brands and setups and some things just work for for people that, that don't quite work for others so Mm-hmm. So yeah, you you really just have to logically think about you know what you need and what you want, mm-hmm. um, and kind of weigh those options and and do your research, I guess you know. And, and this is one thing I've been fighting because I like to hunt, shoot bench rest, shoot other you know up and moving around style matches, uh, and it's kind of hard to find a rifle that fits all those things. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who have a rifle for each one of those specific things. 
So it's been hard for me because I know a lot of the bench rest shooters, they get really heavy setups, very heavy guns. But that's not something I want to go hunting with, and it's certainly not something I want to shoot a match that requires me to hike six miles throughout the day engaging targets. So you really got to just kind of ask yourself what you're going to be doing. I, I leaned more towards uh, a more versatile setup, which is one reason I went with the Tika. Um, mm-hmm. Is because it's it's a light, a very light gun. And yeah, I think I think our Tikas weigh just bare bones, uh, seven and a half pounds. Yeah, so. without a without a scope on it, mm-hmm. um, seven and a half pounds, and then uh, it's got a twenty inch barrel. And my last gun, the 300 Win Mag, the Remington 300 Win Mag, it was a 26 inch barrel. I'm really glad that I've, you know, c- cutting that six inches off, especially once my suppressor arrives, that's going to add another seven inches to my rifle. And so that's definitely some things to consider. So if you're getting ready to buy a new rifle, I would suggest you just write down some, some things you're looking to do with your rifle. Is it just to go out and shoot targets? Do you want to hunt with it? Uh, do you want to shoot matches with it? and just kind of figure out what you want a rifle for and then that will help you in the in the forthcoming steps of choosing what you want in that rifle or, or choosing a rifle mm-hmm. and so once you got that down then <laughs> you start looking the, then you the start long the, the <laughs> long process i mean i think there's some people who have no problem just going down buying whatever is available and that's fine um I'm kind of cursed because I like to research and with the amount of information we have out there, that can be very difficult, (laughs) very difficult to get accurate information and very difficult because it's very easy to focus on negative reviews. Mm -hmm. You can have something have a hundred positive reviews and it only takes one review for to make me, anyway, as a consumer, reconsider it. And that goes with anything that I buy. It's way too easy. And so something I found very useful is to, if it's a rating out of five stars, for instance, I go straight to the three-star reviews because they seem to be the most honest. Because um, sometimes the five-star reviews, I think, are people that are maybe, maybe they're a little brand loyal, so they don't, it doesn't really matter if the item is working as advertised or functioning well, they're going to give it a, a, you know, spotless review. And mm-hmm. then some of the one star reviews are people who maybe they've received one. That's a bit of a lemon or they know a guy who uses one and they don't like him. So they're going <laughs> to give it a bad review. So I go straight to the three stars and that seems to give me the most accurate information. Yeah, that's that's interesting. What I actually uh, and and that's a great way to do it, I'm sure. Um, you know, I've I've kind of done that a little bit. I actually kind of look for almost like the bell curve, you know. Yeah. In in uh, because like in Amazon, for example, you know, they give a little graph of of you know how many one star reviews, two star, three star, four star, five, and you know as long as it kind of curves towards that five star rating you know that mm-hmm. i mean that to me signifies that most people you know are really liking the product and and it's doing well yeah um, that's a good point. but yeah yeah so you know you can kind of use both of those things you know and, and you guys you you've used the internet before you know, <laughs> you <laughs> know <that>. yeah <laughs> could somehow well if they're listening to our this. podcast i hope they <laughs> know how to get here so <laughs> that's true but that is yeah true. so um but yeah, that's just kind of some of the method, methods, you know, that we kind of look at and use. Well, and I guess the point I want to make is don't don't get too frustrated when you kind of get your heart set on something and you look into it and there's a couple people who don't like it. Um, just, like I said, go back to your, your notes, what you want out of the rifle. Does it meet those? Does it meet the criteria of that? Mm-hmm. And if it does, then you can make you can make a good sound judgment call on it and uh this is kind of a tough question because i know we haven't had a ton of experience together uh, Mm -hmm. in terms of shooting tons of different brands of rifles but in your experience so far what have you kind of seen that is like uh you know maybe the trend that people like to use in terms of brands of rifles 
and what has your experience been with different rifles that you've seen or heard of people shooting or that you yourself have used? Me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. You. Yeah, the only other person here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I I know a lot of people really like the Remington 700s. I I you know I've I've not had much experience with those. Um, I've heard a lot of good things though. Not so much recently. Um, you know, I think there was a review by one of my favorite YouTube people, uh, Nut and Fancy. Uh, he's actually here in Utah as well. Great channel. Um, really yeah, great channel. channel. You know, and he has a video of why the Remington 700 sucks. Um, really? I'll have to watch it. He that. does. Yeah, you should watch it. And I share, actually, I share some sentiment there. Some... And, and actually, he lists basically all of the complaints that you had. He uh, lists those as well. So he just um, kind of echoed the same thing. And that's something he I've really seen did. as well. Yeah. And so, you know, it. it uh, um, it's concerning. It's concerning, definitely. I, and it's and I like Remington. Like I like that they're this company that America yes is kind yeah. of it's kind of grown up with America, and it's been a huge part of yeah. Um, of it's gun an icon, culture. and you know? so it's mm-hmm. like to me, it's like watching a sports idol. Take Michael Jordan for example. When you when we were watching him retire and come back and retire and come back, I think at some point, <laughs> and no, that's a great analogy. And yeah, it, it's like. You don't. You want to see them succeed, but it's like you do. You really do. Remington got bought out, or purchased, or traded to, or I'm not sure, but they are owned by a a group called Freedom Group, and I've heard nothing but bad things about this Mm -hmm. organization. And they've been running brands into the ground since they since they started to get a hold of them. Mm -hmm. They ran AAC into the ground. Um, That's not to say that their products aren't aren't any good, because I think AAC is still putting out quality um suppressors but despite all yep i yep. know a lot of people a lot of the people who started aac a lot of the founders just you know, not there like they left they, they yeah. left um because freedom group i don't know if they treated them poorly or what the deal was there but um it was sad because they they kind of had to disband and there's another company called para that's really popular in canada that uh, built really affordable pistols, not not the most accurate and probably not the most functional, but uh, a popular brand that a lot of people liked. Uh, and Remington, I think, recently uh, basically said that they were going to be um, shutting that brand down and they were going to kind of be consuming the product mm. and probably going to make something similar on their own. But it's just sad to see this what Freedom Group's doing and, and now that they've got a hold of Remington... Yeah, and I I don't even see it as Remington anymore. I see it as Freedom Group. Mm. So yeah, I mean you know I don't know if you guys have seen. I still wear my uh, my Remington hat. You know, um, I think on most of the videos that I'm in, I'll be wearing that. And uh, you know, they do make good hats. They do. <laughs> they make good. They make good hats. <laughs> if nothing else. <laughs> Uh, so so no the the R on the hat doesn't stand for Ryan it stands for Remington but uh, they make good hats they do make good so. hats and we'll leave it at, we'll leave it at that but I'm, yeah I'm sure this uh, is the last time I'll uh, express my disdain for for Freedom yeah. Group um, the other company you know that I have been hearing a lot of um, uh, Savage you know uh, they actually seem to be a company that is uh, innovative you know. Mm-hmm. As far as their products go, um, you know they've got they put out the Accu Trigger, uh, which is leaps and bounds um, better than really any other factory trigger for a long time. Uh, the Tikas that we've got, they've they've got an excellent factory trigger. Um, I, I find nothing wrong with with the one that uh, we've been using and and can plan on continuing to use it. Um, but I think Savage kind of started that. Yeah. Um, same with the Accu stock, you know, uh, where they actually had aluminum. Uh, was it aluminum pillars? I know, don't. I think they, they offer. Or no, it's uh, a... pillar bedded on some models, and they also have the uh, channel. It's an aluminum bedding block, I guess you could call it. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it just it, it just helps your action fit to your stock mm-hmm. that much tighter, so there's no room for movement. Which, Wiggle. And... Which, yeah, which helps your uh, your your gun to be more accurate. One thing I think that's 
better about Savage and and even Remington, you know, is customization options. Yeah, that's the um, big thing about Rem- that's one thing I think that keeps Remington going. Right. Is they've been you know. around for so long that everyone and their dog makes products for it. Yeah, I mean, because you know you can get a Remington and accurize it. Um, Absolutely. Drop in a Timney trigger, uh, pick out your favorite barrel manufacturer, and uh, buy something nice, you know. Yeah. Um, a, sh- a Schlin or a or Schillen, Schillen, Schillen. I uh, you know I can't pronounce yeah. 90% of the barrel yeah. manufacturer Krieger. names, so mm-hmm. I just make noises. Right. <laughs> there's like, there's oh, a ton of them though. There are. Um, make you know. Uh, they make really good barrels, um, but yeah, you can you can definitely you know accurize um, a Remington, a lot of customization. Well, let's see what. So we got Remington. We kind of hit them hard. Savage so. Tika, yeah, I'm, that's true. I don't want to uh, beat a dead horse, but I kind of do when I get talking about it. Yeah. So <laughs> we got does. Rem- Remingtons, Tikas, um, Savage, uh, uh, Weatherby. Weatherby is a great Excellent. brand. Yeah, that's. That's one I grew up shooting. Uh, my dad's 300 um, Weatherby Magnum, which I was frightened to shoot when I was younger. Uh, and at some point, I I got addicted to it. I loved the recoil. I loved how violent it was shooting that gun. It was just it was satisfying. So, um, but extremely accurate gun. And mm-hmm. he's had that gun for years, ever since I can remember. And uh, I mean, it'll put a. I was looking at some loads today on it, and it'll put a um, thirty caliber bullet downrange at thirty nine hundred feet per second, which is pretty darn impressive. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I think for a first gun, I would highly recommend a bolt gun, but there's some really good Options. AR platforms. Oh yeah, that you yeah. can get into. Um, I I owned a Sig Sauer uh, AR ten which is a mm. Patrol 716. And I ended up selling it, uh, which I kind of regret. I, I got a really good price out of it. Um, oh, that was is... when the uh, the madness was going down. Yeah, right it after, was. Uh, 2012, I think, it or was beginning kind of 2013. Of when everyone was buying guns and, and um, I was kind of wanting to switch to a Bolt platform. So I basically just put the gun up for sale as a, I didn't even put a price on it. I just put best offer and somebody offered me three grand for it. And that's double what I paid for it. And so I was like, geez, you know, I can get a pretty sweet bolt set up. And that's, that's actually the money I, I used that went into my uh, first gun and my chassis and my scope. Um, but I, I do kind of wish I would have held on to that gun. Cause I think it would have been a fun gun to, to kind of build on. Yeah. Cause that's, you know, in the, the 308 platform yes, yep. uh, for the AR 10, um, I mean, you could have rebarreled it to like uh, 260, you know, mm-hmm. um, and that'd be kind of sweet, you know, a nice semi-automatic 260. Yeah, it was it was heavy. Uh, that was my biggest mm-hmm. issue with it. It was heavy, but uh, it was it was a cool gun. Ryan, talk about what you're doing with your AR right now. Oh um, yeah, you're well, kind of turning um, into a a more long range shooting AR platform. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the. Uh, SPR concept, it's which is a special purpose rifle. Um, you know, just replace the barrel, um, added a a nice match trigger, uh, definitely a nice match barrel as well. Um, I did end up deciding on what I wanted. It was a uh, 20 inch DMC contour, uh, which is a pretty heavy contour, um, not quite like bull uh, or or varmint. And the but... contour is basically just describes the thickness of the barrel or yes. the shape the shape of the barrel as, yeah. as it's kind of tapering, uh, mm-hmm. to the end there. So, um, and, and more of a, a thicker taper, I guess, or a thicker barrel mm-hmm. is going to lead to stiffer, you know, like, a uh, more stiffness, I guess. Yeah. Less harmonics, less barrel whip. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we, we don't really think of our barrels as moving. A yeah. Lot, you moving know? very much when but they we're do. shooting, but if you can imagine what's going on a giant explosion and a bullet being shoved out of there you can guarantee that if you were able to watch that and uh super high speed oh, footage yeah. you, you would definitely see the uh, you know the vibrations going through it and and the bending mm-hmm. so the longer the kind barrel the and the thinner it is the more you're going to get out of that uh yeah yeah the more well the more whipping motion you'll get mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah yeah so 
with a shorter thicker barrel you know obviously you're not going to have that and so that'll lead to accuracy um so that's why they kind of like the 20 uh 18 you know 18 to 20 inch length and uh, uh doesn't kind of move as much but it still has enough uh length in it so that you can build up velocity uh mm-hmm. you can the pressure can continue to push the bullet uh faster and faster as it goes because once you know that bullet leaves the uh the rifling um there's no more speed no added more to that it, well, unless you're running a suppressor, which then you have what's called free bore, or what is it called? Uh, yeah, free, free bore, bore acceleration, uh, acceleration or, yeah. mm-hmm, where just the uh, the pressure behind it, um, because it's still in an enclosed uh, area or space, you know, so you still have pressure behind that, so you can still get a little bit of acceleration out of a suppressor, um, even though you're not actually touching uh, the lands of a yeah. Uh, so it's actually rifling. You're your round has no, there's no friction on it at all. All you have is the gas is pushing on it. So um, I think it's a common myth. People think that suppressors slow, slow a bullet down. It actually uh, does not. But if yeah. anything, you're going to see an increase. You mm-hmm. might not see, you might not see any increase at all, but yeah, uh, if yeah. anything, if your if your velocity changes, it's going to go up. Yeah. Exactly. It might only be 20 feet per second, but yeah. Um, so anyway, long story short, um, you know, I decided to kind of make my own version of, of this, kind of a, a longer range, accurate um, AR-15. And so, uh, uh, you know, got myself a nice Krieger barrel, um, has a 1 in 7.7 twist rate. Um, and uh, I don't know, do we want to talk about twist rate a little bit? Uh, this is something that confused me for quite a while. I wasn't sure i mean honestly i didn't even know there was a twist rating i figured just every barrel had some uh riflings cut into it and that's about it yeah so uh ryan what is a twist rate what is a twist rate yeah <laughs> so basically uh the twist rate is how many twists you have um it's a uh, ratio right yeah it's a ratio of like uh twists per it's oh okay it's you're doing a great job on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so it's so I like my barrel is a one in seven twist rate. Uh-huh. So, uh, for what the every length, seven every, inches. Yeah, every, yeah. There we go. Every seven inches, you have one. You twist. got one twist exactly. So, Thank you. Um, so one in ten twist, and you have a twenty-six inch barrel. You're gonna get, you know, two twists plus sixty percent more. Uh, yeah. So you know, two and a half twists, and. Uh, on Artica's, we have what are they? Mine's a one and eight twist because it's a two sixty. Mm-hmm. Yours is a one and eleven. Yeah, one and eleven and a quarter. I think it is. <laughs> Tika. Yes. <laughs> so, so Ryan's is a little bit slower of a twist rate. Yeah. Um, you could call it slower or less, I mm-hmm. guess. And my my question once I learned what a twist rate was was like, okay, well, why? Because some. 300 wind mags had a one in 10 inch and some had a one in 12 and there's some that have one in 11. So I thought, why? What's the there, deal? There must be, there must be something going on here. I'm still not even sure. I think over time as bullets have progressed and have gotten, I guess they've evolved um, in the last 50 years a ton. And now we've got these, these really long, they call them like uh burger has VLDs and they're very, very, low drag is what mm-hmm. the VLD stands for. And they have these really high BCs, these really high ballistic coefficients. And they're really long. And they're finding that the slower twist rates aren't able to stabilize these heavier, mm-hmm. longer bullets. Longer bullets, right. So you need a faster twist rate to stabilize that bullet. And that actually, the twist rate will actually make it, you know, I mean, the the shorter the twist rate, so like a 1 in 7, you know, versus like a 1 in 11 or uh-huh. 12, you know, that'll actually make the bullet spin, you know, faster. Yeah, in, in exactly. flight, just like a football. Basically. So think yeah, of it as a football, like a football. Um, except if you have like a really fast twist rate, then your gun's going to do better, it seems, at stabilizing the heavier bullets, but... but it might over spin lighter bullets. That that that's also a problem. You got to know the twist rate of your barrel in order to to be selecting the right kind of ammunition for it. In order to stabilize those heavier bullets, you gotta you gotta be able to spin them quickly enough. Otherwise, they they tumble. They'll actually get out there, destabilize, and start turning end over end, 
and that is not what you want. No, for, not for precision for accuracy. rifle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you, and you can notice if you're shooting paper, you'll notice they call it like a keyhole, and there's some other names for it. Uh, basically, it's just a big long tear in your paper instead of a nice circular hole. Um, that'll tell you that your bullets are tumbling if you're seeing those those elongated tears through the paper. So that's something to watch for. So that's that's what barrel twists are. I mean, is there much more to say about it other than that, I guess? Yeah, it's something well, that I'm still kind of learning. Um, yeah. But that's as I understand it right now. Yeah, just matching, you know, the ammunition to the twist rate. That's really uh, the best thing to learn, I guess, from that. Um, I guess, or that's what to take away, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just something to yeah. be aware of. Just know how that, that your barrels do have different twist rate. It's something you should look into when purchasing a new rifle. And it's something that you should understand. And if you want to understand it more, obviously you can, I'm sure, Google around for a bit and read a couple of articles on the science behind it. But in a nutshell, that's what you're going to be reading or that's what you're going to find out. I, I, I think we could talk for hours on calibers, so I, yeah. I don't want to get too deep into it. But um, I guess, you know, just look into it. Look into some of the around like 308, 260, anything in 6.5, like 6.5 Creedmoor. Um for the six AR five, platform, yeah, and the, the yeah, ARs. they've got the 6.5 Grendel. Uh huh. Um, but then you know you have to look at cost and and availability. Yes, definitely uh, weigh those things. So when yeah. you're looking at a caliber, look into that. Find out how much it costs to buy brass for it. Find out how much the uh, ammunition, the bullets, cost for it. Um, how much powder it takes to load, and and that's kind of how you're gonna gonna find. And also find out how many rounds people are getting through barrels before they're burning them up. It's also something to consider. 308, you can shoot all day long not for years, worry. and you're not going to shoot your barrel out. So, I mean, you just have to weigh what's good for you, what um, weigh, your, weigh those options. It so. really does. It all, it all goes back to what applications are you going to be using the gun for, and that'll really help you whittle it down. You know, you, mm -hmm. you don't really need a 338 Lapua if, you know, I feel like that's a very niche area i i, I yeah. want one because they're a big gun and they make a loud noise and i can shoot things a long ways away that's that's all wants that's that's not need right you know that all falls into the want category because it's just i guess it's just got that cool factor um which is great i mean if you got the cash <laughs> go buy stuff because it's fun mm -hmm. nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but if you're like me and ryan and you got you know, Ryan's got six kids and two wives, <laughs> two and so wives. <laughs> that costs a lot of money. <laughs> so he doesn't have a lot of extra spending money. So. Uh, still single, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> where are we at here? We've covered quite a bit, as you can see or hear. Uh, yes. There's a lot yeah. that goes into it, picking a rifle. So if you're unlike me and you can just walk in and buy a rifle, you're gonna save. <laughs> just your, do that. You're gonna save yourself walk, a huge walk headache. Walk into Cabela's, just you know. Point. Ask the guy, you know, what do you recommend? You know, I'm sure he'll sell you something. So. Oh, absolutely. I have no problem <laughs> selling you something. Um, yeah, I would just, I don't know, just point at the wall and say you want that one. And he's going to say, this one? You're going right. to say, yep, <laughs> that's the one. So yep, if you have no you problem go. with that, just do that. Yeah. <laughs> one thing uh, that I think... Ryan and I have we've already talked about but that we liked about our rifles is it came with some oh I don't know aftermarket upgrades uh they came with threaded barrels and the top rail so that's something else to look for a lot of companies make uh a model of a gun and then they make another model of the same gun that's got a couple of upgrades um that you may be able to save some money on because it, it can cost 50 to 100 dollars to thread a barrel and sure you know a good rail can cost you another hundred dollars easily and and so those those are things to look at. Yeah, and then uh, you also got to remember you got to put a scope on it. Yes. I guess you don't have to. You should Scopes. though. So so Jace, you just uh, recently purchased a new scope. We both did. We both did. Since yep. the last episode, we have both purchased new scopes. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> I think so. I think um, so. Did right? I talk about yeah. I think yours is on its way. Was it on? It might have been on its way. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't uh, pay attention to what we say. No, I, we just talk and ramble we just on. Talk. Um, but yeah, so uh, we'll talk about a little bit what you got first, and I'll go ahead after you. I 
about had an aneurysm trying to oh, select goodness. an optic yeah. because once again I have that disease where I have to look into everything under the sun and I ask the opinions of people and of course I get positive feedback on one optic and on that same optic I have somebody else tell me it's garbage and so it's tough it's really tough so you just kind of have to wade through all the information and then finally you just have to make a decision but uh, I sold my Vortex HS LR is what I was running and loved the scope I think I still think it's one of the best scopes you can get for $800 mm-hmm. and I'd highly recommend it to anyone but I told Ryan my plan oh I got the hiccups that's not good um, I I told Ryan, I want to just build one rifle that's kind of pimped out. I want to have a suppressor on it. I want to have a really good optic. I'm going to put a quick release mount on my optic. Mm -hmm. Once I do that, then any rifle I buy in the future, I can take the suppressor off and the scope off of one rifle and put it on the other. And that's kind of my long-term plan. So I'm just focusing on getting high-quality uh, accessories and high quality things onto my gun now and high quality glass is really expensive now the vortex was really good but I'd say it was medium quality you know zoomed in at 24 uh, looking down range not the clearest picture in the world some pretty heavy chromatic aberration which is a purple haze that you'll see in mm-hmm. high contrast areas where dark and light uh, lines meet so if you're looking at your target that's white around the edges of it you might see kind of this purple haze that's called chromatic aberration and it's something you see in camera lenses and scopes any any kind of lens spotting scopes uh, something to look out for but that's something you're going to see go away in the higher end the two three thousand four thousand dollar optics um, you're going to see a crisper picture and uh, you're not going to see that chromatic aberration i did tons of research and I was going to go with a new Night Force ATAC R that comes out in the next couple of months, probably springtime. And it's the first focal plane scope from, from Night Force. And it, it just was a little too expensive. Mm-hmm. I believe they're going to come out for around the $2,800 range, maybe a little cheaper. And they're not out yet. And so. I started looking around. I looked at some Bushnell stuff. I looked at the Vortex Razor HD2, which I was really close to buying, but then I saw that it weighed over three pounds, and, and that's, that's a lot. heavy. That's that heavy, for heavy. A, for a scope. That's pretty dang heavy. And and it's so, like we were saying, you know, if you want to hunt with that or do anything other than just sit it down at a bench rest, you know, type competition or hold uh, your or, boat or down shooting. when you're fishing. Right, yeah. You work for yeah. that. No, I mean, there's a lot of people who love the the, the Razor Gen 2s, and I'm sure they're great glass, but for me personally, I just didn't want that extra weight. So I went with the Steiner T5XI, which uh, had everything I wanted. Um, it's mill dot, so I'm going to have to... I'm a communist now, basically. Mm-hmm, basically. So, so I've had to relearn. I, I didn't understand how to use a mill reticle or mill turrets um i've been using moa and the vortex but it's not very hard and i feel like i've got a pretty good grasp of it now i'll I'll learn you your your ways there yeah and i got ryan to help me he's been a communist since i've known forever yeah um and so so yeah i'm super excited it's just sitting in the box though because i don't have the mount for it that should be here in a couple days and then i don't think i'll get to shoot it probably for a week or more i'm taking a trip to London town for a week and so my gun's just going to be lonely sitting in my room and my optic as well so uh so yeah I'm really excited to try it out I've I've taped it to my uh yeah you heard right I taped oh, yeah. it to my <laughs> action or your no your I, gun. <laughs> uh, I I taped it to my tripod oh your tripod my camera <laughs> tripod so I I I rigged up a I, I basically just put some a towel over it and then taped it to the head of my tripod and so I could take it outside and look through it and it looks great. Looks really, really good, so That's awesome. Yeah, I'm excited to use that. And uh Ryan, you went with the 
the Bushnell, yeah. Uh, so I did go with the Bushnell. Uh, it's the HDMR, uh, which is their Horus DMR uh, scope. Um, it's the H59 reticle, and so basically, you know, we, we kind of talked about this a little bit in our last episode, but uh, uh, it's kind of a grid kind of format. Um, mill, uh, mill rads is what they're using there, so mm-hmm. not MOA, that communist, you know, mill rad. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it basically, you know, it's really good just for doing holdovers. Um, it's really good for that. Yeah. It's like probably excellent. the best there is out there. Yeah, and what Ryan so. means by that is, you don't have to dial yeah. your elevation in. You can just do it all in your reticle if you want, or most yeah. of it. It's a busy reticle, and a lot of people are turned off by that. But I've I've heard that the people who use it for a little while end up really, really liking it, and they get used mm-hmm. to it, and they wouldn't go back to anything else. So I think that's really, really cool for the Horus style reticles. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, and as, as Jason said, I'm not scared, so I just jumped right in it. And, yeah, I'm surprised he didn't spray paint the reticle right. <laughs> as soon as he got it. That's right. <laughs> so just jumped right in there and uh, trying it out, and it's it's awesome. I have shot that one uh, once now, just got it sighted That's right, in. you got it on paper with your nine yep. shots. Uh, yep, nine <laughs> shots to get it. Trying to yeah. nine shot or nine loaded rounds out to the range. Yes, I, that's all I had was nine <laughs> rounds, and uh, sighted that thing in and shot a bit more, and that was that. So, <laughs> yep. It was snowing on us. Oh, yeah. So, it was great fun, uh, though. Chase yeah. was cold, though. I definitely got cold. Yeah, so... And I don't get cold very easily, but uh, yeah, I got cold fast. It was kind of a, a sleet, a wet, rainy it was. snow. It was, so it, it was gross. It would land, and then it would melt, and then it would make you miserable. So, um, But yeah, it was the last time I used my Vortex. It, it now has a new home in Montana, mm-hmm. and uh, I hope its new owner is treating it well and feeding it what it likes to eat. Yep. And all yep. those things. So I, I that's a pretty good overview of the things to to look look into and in selecting a rifle for a long range application yeah i think it's thoroughly covered so there you go ladies and gentlemen we're gonna move on real quick to some user feedback which we love uh, especially when it's positive i've still yet to get any hate mail or uh that's not an invitation no but, you know. <laughs> no, I, I, no i don't want to get any but it's great that uh, so far yeah, we haven't gotten any everything's been... been really positive and uh, we got two new reviews on iTunes. The first one comes in from Don K from Michigan, and he says, I'm very excited to finally find another long-range podcast. This is by far my favorite type of shooting, and I've always felt that there weren't nearly enough podcasts out there to cover the vast amount of information regarding the subject, and that is exactly why we started this podcast in the first place, Don. So we're glad that uh, people out there are consuming it and enjoying the the podcast so far we're only three episodes in so far but uh, everything's been going great and uh the second one the second review and these are both five star reviews so thank you guys for that truth truth hunter comes in with uh more will be appreciated friendly people talking about guns scopes ammunition and much more count me in thank you gentlemen for that you are welcome truth hunter what else did we have ryan Oh, um, oh, oh! The comment from uh, we had a comment on one of our videos on YouTube. Yeah, by uh, Azzy Blankenship. <laughs> I hope I'm saying that right. Probably not. He says I'm right. seriously contemplating one of these rifles. He's referring to the 308 and the 260 Tikas that we have mm-hmm. in, in this video. Which rifle of the two calibers? have shot the best consistently at 500 plus yards. I'm thinking 260 for myself. What kind of velocities are you getting with the 260 and which bullets? And so I think this kind of sparked a little challenge that Ryan and I are going to do as soon as we can. Yeah. And uh, we're going to have a little shoot off. And see what we can do to find out and answer that question. Yes, I think what we're going to do is set a target up 500 yards and we're going to give ourselves five shots at a at a target that's that's not the one we're shooting at is that is that right is that what we're yeah the, like a steel plate yeah that you steel guys plate, and then we're gonna have a one moa target that we'll use for the contest yes would you think 
uh yeah just the paper target you know yeah so we'll we'll make sure we're on at first with yeah. the, the steel plate and then uh i think was it 10 shots and then yep. just add up the uh add up the score yeah on that that paper target target and i will be spotting for jace and i will do my best to make sure that my spots are accurate uh-huh. uh so you know he'll maybe shoot first we'll maybe flip a coin i don't know uh see who shoots first um and then i will go and he will spot for me uh to hit the best of his ability and uh and we'll just see where we come in at so yeah it should be fun. it should be fun uh yeah i'm excited for it so we're gonna put the 260 and the 308 uh head to head and see see how they how they fare and really it's it's more <laughs> It's probably more of a we... measurement of the shooters <laughs> than anything, because so. I think the rifles are much better than we are. <laughs> yeah, but it'll be fun anyways. It so. will be. It will be. Yep. So you guys can look forward to that. Um, and, uh, again, we thank anyone for any feedback. We've been getting feedback on our Facebook page um, through uh, the Reddit and youtube and so it's been really great to hear from people in similar situations as us and we've also got some really good advice from from those are who who are a little more seasoned in the sport and uh, we just appreciate people taking time because i know in this uh, attention deficit world that we live in uh, time is a hugely expensive commodity to come by so we definitely appreciate uh, anyone who drops us a line and uh now i think we're going to move into the, the pick of the week or uh, some kind of product that we've been using that we that we want to talk about real quick. Let you guys kind of know what we like or dislike. It's probably mostly going to be what we like. Um, but uh, Ryan, I'm going to let you go ahead and tell us what your pick of the week is. Oh sure. Um, so you know, with uh, with any long range shooting uh, prospects, you know, you need uh, ammunition. No. And, yeah. <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, uh, my pick, you know, actually has to do with reloading ammo. Uh, it's the RCBS Charge Master 1500 oh, combo. Oh, I want one of those. Oh, the RCBS combo. It's uh, it's fantastic. Um, so basically, what it does, uh, it it is a powder measurer, and uh, uh, so you you have a hopper that you fill up your your powder into, and then it's got a, a digital keypad. And you tell it what charge uh, to give it. So I use in my uh, my Tika T3 uh, 308 rifle a TAC ramshot powder. Uh, it's kind of a uh, a small flake um, powder. Really, really kind of. Uh, it's hard to describe, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of thin and, and uh, wispy. And just wispy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but um, uh, so that's what I use. And, uh, you just, you know, you just, I use a 45 grain charge. Uh, that's what my rifle seems to be liking. So it, uh, so I put in 45, uh, and then I hit the dispense key and, uh, it just sits there and it'll, it'll quickly throw out, um, exactly to the, uh, 10th, I believe of a grain, uh, 45 grains of powder, um, which is awesome because I don't do a darn thing. It does it all for me. Um, and Ryan it's accurate loves that. and it's fast. Yeah. It's uh, basically my... like having a little reloading butler that <laughs> little, lives yes. on your reloading bench. <laughs> a little man. You yeah. tell him what you want and he gives it to you. <laughs> and he goes and runs and grabs it for you again and again and again yes. over and over. He doesn't ask questions. No. He doesn't say, are you sure? He doesn't harbor resentment want. for you. <laughs> he just does his job and you get what you want. And Every time. I'm a little jealous because uh, we do a lot of reloading. Yeah. Um, and I think in my workflow, that's what slows me down the most is when I get to where I'm charging cases because I'm throwing a, a charge and then I'm measuring it and then I'm trickling in or removing a little bit to get it just right. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I'm spending a lot of time when you're doing, even when you're doing 50 rounds and sure. it really adds up. So yeah, that's the, uh, RCBS charge master. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's been such a time saver and worth the cost of entry for sure. Yeah. So time is money so. for sure. So yeah. Jace, how are you? What do you got today for us? Uh, what do I have for us? Um, I bought... I have a really, I don't know if I have a weird, like a weird shaped face, but I have a problem with getting my eye line 
um, down my scope. It's his face. I think I just have a weird <laughs> face. And I, I need an exceptionally high cheek weld. Because um, the last thing you want to do is, is lift your head or have to adjust your head to look down your scope. You want to be able to lay on it as comfortably as possible and open your eyes and ha- and be looking right down your scope without having to move or shift or raise your head because that's a very important point of contact. And so you want to use that to its full potential. So um, a long time ago when I bought my 300 Win Mag, uh, the, the, the stock stock <laughs> that came on it, um, definitely wasn't high enough for me to, to look down the scope. So I started looking into solutions to getting a higher cheek weld and I came across what's called the AccuPack cheek riser. And, uh, I found it on specopsbrand.com and, uh, they're basically like a Velcro, a system of Velcro straps and it wraps around your existing stock and it secures tightly. And it's got a back strap that goes around the back of your stock so it won't slide forward. And it holds it in place really nice. And then it comes with these little, like, uh, foam inserts that you can put in there. And it comes with three different heights. You can mix and match or just use one. I just use the one thick one. And uh, I put that in there, and and it raises my cheek up about an inch and a half. And it's perfect. And it's comfortable. And it's got a little pouch on the side of it. You can... Put your fruit snacks in. <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever, you whatever your kids are eating these days. Um, you know, you can throw some extra ammunition in there. You can put your range card in there. Um, maybe if you've got a suppressor, you can put a laminated copy of your stamp. Uh, Definitely. In there. And so, just been really useful. It's easy to take off. You don't have to do any uh, modifications to your stock. You don't have to drill holes in it or anything like that. And they're under fifty dollars. So. Uh, for anyone having issues with cheek weld, um, for anyone out there who has a weird face like me, go and buy an AccuPack cheek riser because I think they're they're fantastic. It's no charge master, but no, but that's all right. <laughs> but they are sweet, and uh, I think that wraps up our our third episode. Yeah, I I think this has been we a, made it a good one. I don't think we ever thought we'd make it to a third episode. But we did. But here we are. <laughs> they all doubted us. But they all <laughs> doubted us. It's true. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I I think uh, we're gonna start doing this weekly when I get back. Which will be. I don't know. No, I do know. When? <laughs> okay. Okay. So this this episode should go up on Tuesday. If you're listening to this on the day it came out, it should be like March third ish, um, or second. I don't I don't know how to do math. I don't know what today is. I think it'll be around the third. Um, yeah, I you're leave. Right. I leave on Friday and I get back the following Friday. So Ryan and I will probably record episode four that weekend. So, um, two weeks from now and get that episode up. And then from then on out, we'll probably try our best to get an episode out every week. Definitely. If your wives will allow you. All of them. Yeah. (laughs) So, (laughs) so yeah, uh, once again, we thank everyone for listening. We love everybody out there. Thanks for being a part of this, and we look forward to seeing you on episode four.